You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Filmmaking Conversations with Damian Swaby. Listen to conversations with award-winning filmmakers, directors from the golden age of television, and creatives from the indie film community who continue to inspire the next generation of filmmakers. And now, over to your host, Damian Swaby. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Filmmaking Conversations with me, your host, Damian Swaby. Today, I have a very special guest on the show, Matilda De Hay. She's a method actress who trained at the prestigious Lee Strasberg Theatre and Film Institute in New York City. She left a huge mark on the world of television with her captivating performances. From 2018 to 2019, she brought to life the crucial character of Amenti in both seasons of the hit anthology series Castle Rock. A brilliant collaboration between J.J. Abrahams and Stephen King for Hulu. More recently, from 2022 to 2023, she played the character of Snake in the final two seasons of Servant, the riveting Apple TV series. Her performances have garnered high praise, so stay tuned as we delve into the journey of this remarkable actress and explore the stories behind her mesmerizing performances. Why America in particular? Because a lot of people from Europe would go to, to London, would come to England, or obviously a lot of people from Europe go to America. But what made you make the decision to go to America? I think, um, well, originally I visited New York a few years before with my family, and I really felt a strong pull towards the city. Um, but also, you know, it's um, London, yeah, sure, sounds great. And also because it's, it's close to Belgium and I would have had my, my papers. But for whatever reason, no, I wasn't so pulled towards it. Maybe the gray skies that we just talked about. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I was, I felt cold by by New York when I visited. And then, you know, I, I the schools that I went to were also um, appealing to me. Because you, you, men, you mentioned New York being very appealing and I can mm-hmm. completely understand because mm-hmm. I've been to New York more than anywhere in the world. I've, I've been there, mm-hmm. I think, three times this year. Wow. Um, planning to go back on, for, on a four, for a fourth in November. Mm-hmm. What exactly, because I'm a huge lover of indie film. Yeah. Um, and I believe it's in terms of, uh, let's just say, modern times in, in my history, that's for sure, in the last 40 years, it's been the home of indie film. It's where a lot of the, the indie filmmakers that I love and enjoy watching make great work. That's my kind of draw and pull to New York. What exactly is New York? Why exactly is New York a big draw for you? What pulls you in? What made you fall in love with it? I think many things, but Probably the first that comes to mind is the melting pot that it is. All the different cultures, all the different sorts of people. Uh, anybody can kind of can be who they want to be much more than at least where I'm from. Um, yeah. I moved here when I was 18. So, you know, I was also younger than now. And uh, that was very appealing to me because, you know, as a, as a teen, I didn't really feel so much that I fit in in many ways. And in okay. New York, I really felt that I did. Um, I'm, I'm a creative and here there's a lot of creatives. Mm. So it's feeling surrounded by this energy and this drive. And, you know, like the song says it, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. I believe holds a lot of truth because, you know, life here is tough as well. It's very beautiful yeah. and, you know, in many artistic ways, but it's also very tough. Life is expensive, you know, it's a big city. So there's also a lot of suffering, you know, and so it's constantly going. Um, So, yeah, but I would say that's what it is, being surrounded by such beautiful, interesting people who just are willing to embrace their heart and who they are and put it out there, which is quite, I I find it personally quite uh, brave, uh, yeah, I think that's that's a big part of it. Yeah. Excellent. And it is brave. You're right. I, I really agree with you. And in New York, you studied method acting. Yes, I did. Why exactly did you start study method acting and 
how do you think it shaped you as an actress? So much. Um, you know why I chose it? So I first went to a language school because I didn't speak English. I was, you know, fresh out of high school and um, I needed to learn English. I just had a little bit in school. I mean, I had it for many years, but I couldn't hold a conversation. I went to see oh, the social okay. network. I did not understand, you know, so I wasn't <laughs> fluent at all. So I, I went to a language school to learn and also to see how I felt just living here at first you know, mm. for about a year studying the, the language and and really integrating there. And then I went to, while during that first year, I started taking acting classes in different places. I studied some Meisner. That was my first introduction in the U.S. Uh, to, to some acting classes. Um, and then I went to the New York Film Academy. And then I decided to stay. And I did first one year at the New York Film Academy after that first year. So, and then I knew that wasn't enough. I didn't find... Um, what fully I didn't feel ready. I didn't know, you know, from there where I should be going. Um, but I knew of the actor's studio and I knew very vaguely of the different schools, Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler. And so I, I looked into all of them, seeing where I felt to pull, you know, to, um, to make my decision. And then, uh, I found, you know, Lee Strasberg to be the one that resonated the most. I was, and, and Stella Adler did too, so I was accepted in a program there, and then to Lee, at Lee Strasberg. And Lee Strasberg just, it felt, it, it, I followed my instinct. It felt natural to me, and then how it shaped me, I think, so much, because I am, I, I do work, it, we work with our senses, um, and we use our personal, you know, um, our instrument, which I believe we always do. It's just that you know, other techniques go about it in different ways, but the way the method um, works for me really right away, uh, yeah, it got me. Uh, it, it shaped me as, how did it shape me? How could I, um, so much now, because also, you know, I do yoga, I, I do Kundalini yoga and I do, I meditate and I, I find a lot of correlations between the two you know, um, in terms of sense memory, also sense memory was so healing for me, um, you know, because a lot of it is a bit like shamanic work, you know, which is exploring, you know, different things of your life and knowing who you are. So for me, it felt really I could explore all these different things about who who I was. And, you know, again, sure, at that point, I was in my early 20s. Um, and, and I had a lot to understand, I felt about where I came from and what had happened to me. And, you know, cause we all have all these traumas, all these stories, you know, sure some more than others, but we all have, you know, things that have happened to us by that age. And I, as a creative, I needed to understand what all that was. And that really helped me, uh, to, to heal a lot of things, to become a better creator as well. I practice the method daily. Um, you know, and it's, um, yeah, it's part of my life. I'd say, you know, it's my instrument. That's how Lee Strasberg saw it, that, you know, we are everything. We are the, as a violinist, it would be the violin, a painter, the painter with themselves. We are everything. So we have to work on our voice, our body, you know, and our mind. And so I do believe today that to be the best creative is to, be in a sense the more aware of who you are so that you can then focus on someone that you're not and seeing what you can use and what you can create i love it too because it's so it uses the imagination a lot and i'm a pre-imaginative person and so we combine you know different exercises to exercises to see the results that come out of it so i think there's a lot of misconceptions about you know the method and using our own life in such a way that maybe is self-centered when really it's, it's not at all. It, it's never about us. I don't believe that Lee ever said that, but it goes through us. So, you know, uh, but it's about, it's about the, the characters and serving the script. And, and for that, it, it, I find it wonderful uh, to find what we have and combine things and create and be willing to take risks. Uh, Cause it can be very, you know, you can look like a fool, I feel, not in two <laughs> ways, but, you know, if you combine yeah. all these things, you never fully know until you try what's going to come out of it. Um, but, yeah, you know, there's there's no real, I guess, failure. Anyway, I have to stop because I 
keep on going. <laughs> That's great. No, I love it. I love it. I love it. You yeah. said some great stuff there. But what I'm thinking is, mm. with, with all that's been said, you're in a situation where you've got this brilliant education, this brilliant training, and you're a brilliant actress. When you go into auditions and you actually get the roles for parts that you really want to play, mm. how do you prepare for those roles with your training? Because it's one thing to be trained and to be in training, but when you've got the actual job, what are the main differences for you? You know, I feel it's always work in progress because also that's something else that, you know, was emphasized that you can't wait for the audition or, you know, the, the work to arrive for you to start training those senses and the different combinations. If you talk about the method specifically that you want to use, uh, if you want to use, you know, because it depends what the, cre the, what the, the uh, character is, what the story is, what the genre is. But, you know, it, it's constantly implementing things. And so... I do the same thing that I would do when I was in school working on a character or if I, I still right now I go to open calls for Broadway and I do the same preparation. I try to keep my instrument, you know, as active as it can so that it's never OK. Now, you know, this big thing is coming. Um, so I guess it's it's always kind of going uh, now. There's different things that I can touch upon, you know, because Lee Strasberg didn't just focus on um sense memory we also did animal work so that's something i also no. like to do yeah um so because it's good for movement as well and you know getting out of your own habits and um yeah finding different things there but also etudes i like to do which are basically improvisation of scenes that are not in the script uh i like to also interview myself as the character uh, oh. Find the differences between the character and myself. See the the things that are similar. Um, yeah, I, I look. I, I first analyze whatever I'm given, um, and I, I analyze it as much as I can. You know, and that varies greatly with what we're given. You know, I'm not a lead actor in any you know enormous production. Uh, so usually, the least you know known you are the least the less big the role is if we're to talk about at least you know um, studio productions the less you're given you know and I find in general in castings it's the same I'd say maybe more for indies you would be given uh more you know but so you have a lot you know you can it's freeing in many ways because you can also create you know um, mm. many different things so yeah I look at at these different I did these different things and I see once I know I have an idea of what they're trying to communicate and what's going on. Then I go to what I've learned and I see, okay, with the time that I have, because that's always also, you know, film and TV, you don't have much yeah. time, you know? So with the time that I have, I try to make the best use of it with seeing what am I inspired, you know, to be using. And then also, you know, in my meditations, I also contemplate, I like to, you know, see the scenes and see what's coming to me. So I, I do, yeah, some different different things. <laughs> Excellent. But you mentioned studio productions. Yeah. You, you've been part of a show called Castle Rock, right? Yes, I have. Tell us about your experience in that show and what was your character about? Yeah, beautiful. It was, uh, so Castle Rock was a J.J. Abrams and Stephen King uh, production. I was in the two seasons. They only did two. It got canceled during the pandemic. Um, and but I was lucky enough to be a part of those two first. I was briefly in the the first, and then my character was explained a bit more in the second. I'm playing this mystical character called Amity from the 1600 um, that you know um, is is speaking French, uh, and that is basically you know there was this whole um, it exposed parallel realities, and I'm one that is in the parallel reality you know of the show. Um, and it's, I can't tell you too much because otherwise, if you're going to watch the show, I'm terrible at doing this one thing. <laughs> I don't want to give away the wrong thing, but basically, yeah, that, that's who I was, I was playing and the experience was fantastic. It was my first for a big, um, a big, a studio, you know, um, and obviously, you know, not just a studio, it's JJ Abrams, it's Stephen King. I grew up loving Stephen King. Um, I've said before, you know, my mom, when I, she was pregnant with me, she oh. read all books of Stephen King, but she was never a horror fan. And suddenly when she was pregnant with me, she was, she wanted to, you know, read all these books. And also Agatha Christie. 
And so it's quite funny that, you know, I've, and then once I was born, she didn't have that sort of sort of pull towards it. So who knows if I've, I've brought that into her, but, you know, so that was for me on that level, obviously it, it was such a big opportunity. Um, I was in Paris at the time because I had just got, I just signed with a bigger agency there, but then Excellent. I went to New York. So, you know, everything kind of happened, you know, at once and wondering where should I be? But um, anyway, to go back to the production, it, it was so beautiful because I got to work. One, the main director that sticks with me is Lonnie Peristere, who's wonderful. He's been he's done a bunch of uh, episodes for American, American Horror Story. Sorry. And he's such a giving, calm, um, open director that I couldn't have been luckier in a sense to, for the second season, spend a month with you know him directing me. Um, and yeah, it, it was wonderful. Um, I got to work with, I got to watch uh, Tim Robbins work and Paul wow. Sparks and, you know, they're so inspiring. They're too specifically, that's for me, the way they go about their craft resonates with me. You know, they're both still involved in the theater and, oh. you know, and they're, they're, they're quote unquote serious, you know, about, about the craft and, and watching them was just that, you know, a gift and then Bill Skarsgård I got to have a scene with which obviously was very it was very brief but was still very you know enlightening to just be in the presence of such people yeah uh, so yeah it, it was beautiful I can just feel your passion for acting and the craft of it bursting through yeah. the screen um, <laughs> I hope it's contagious for people listening to so. it's really there but where do you think it comes from because obviously a lot of people want to act a lot of people want to be on screen they want to be on stage sometimes it comes from a parent you, you mentioned your mother reading certain books is she someone who's involved in acting do you have no. a, a family friend or is it just purely maybe even your perhaps potential need to fit in that took you to New York to, to act you know I actually over don't think so that was part of why the city called me to be able to blossom in a way to embrace I feel at least my own gifts that I felt more constrained in exploring where I was from and that I had started exploring on stage over there I did some theater in school and some improv and I really fell madly in love with it but also when I was young not even three apparently I begged my mom to start dancing my sister is three years older than me and she was you know in that school already and apparently I wouldn't stop begging and so my mom even lied on my age because uh, we were supposed to be three so she changed my year of birth you know to, so that I could start uh, so it started really there but I, I loved I also painted I loved painting you know on silk I did a bunch of classes for that and and I played a little bit of violin now I'm even more actually interested towards instruments which I led on That's the cool. side when yeah. I was uh, younger but so things were pulling me in creativity uh, and then well the stage I really fell in love with it in high school um, and so I didn't know you know I was encouraged by some wonderful teachers there you know people who are uh, one lady who's a comedian in Belgium Isabelle, she was really uh, encouraging me to pursue this wherever it would lead, you know. And so I followed that spark, really. But it didn't come from my parents, although, you know, my mom is a preach. My mom is a very, my whole family is made of pretty sensitive people, sometimes heretic too. But, you know, um, no, no people who are living of their art or artists per se. Uh, my grandfather was an equist. He used to do, you know, a voltage in French, um, which is, you know, when you do uh, figures like hops on horses. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. And so he would do that in, in a circus. He was in, in the Black Tulip, that movie, <laughs> you know, from so, so long ago. And that's where he actually ended up meeting my grandma uh, oh. in London, funny enough, uh, in the circus there. And she was working as a, as a maid in a hotel where he stayed. And anyway, that's where that began. But aside <laughs> from him, you know, having more of that maybe artistic, you know, side. No, my, pa my father loved music. Uh, he plays saxophone, nice. uh, you know. But yeah, no. And uh, so it didn't come directly from them. I think, you know, it's something that comes before perhaps that, you know, be before... I think the soul, you know, has something yeah. that for me resonated and I couldn't, I couldn't do otherwise, 
you know? Um, and even now when things get get hard and have gotten hard and I've re-questioned so much of this, it's, it's not possible for me to do otherwise because it would be as if I'm lying to myself or I'm, it, the alternate is just not, you know? conceivable uh to really pursue as long as there is a flame as there's something you know um yeah so in those tough times that i think it's fair to say the majority of actors and mm -hmm. all creatives have yeah. some tough times we yeah. we go through some tough times mm -hmm. how do you keep the flame burning i'm lucky enough maybe to have such adhd and a mind that is racing and um also hyperactivity in that, you know, in that, in that sense, I have never enough time to do what I want. So of course, if I'm in the negative, you know, mindset and that grabs the same thing and, you know, depending on what's going on in my life, I can be led, you know, so down that uh, dark hole, but lucky enough for me today, I never stay there very long anymore um, because I feel that it's come from, the way I go about my craft and about my life, how they're intertwined and how, you know, I believe that I can never, whilst, for example, the strikes are going on, I can use this time to create so many other things. I can, mm -hmm. first of all, you know, work on myself. And because I love to meditate and do yoga, that makes me also more creative. I still love to paint, you know, and something that I don't share, you know, with people also write a bunch. I read, uh, you know, I, I like to take myself to the museum. Uh, I like to just stay again, nourish myself as much as I can, you know, from life. And for that, for me, in a way, there's never enough time, you know. So the suffering comes more from the non-ability to do this craft specifically because unlike a painter or a musician, we don't, quote unquote, just need ourselves and that. We need a whole team to make it come together. Yeah. We don't do our monologues alone in our room. I mean, we do too to, again, train and all that if that's what, you know, the part of that work, the preparation. But sure, my soul sometimes very much still can suffer from the inability to do that. But um, thankfully today, I have enough awareness to not let it stay that way. And instead of being destructive, try to be constructive. Mm -hmm. You know, I love it. can I do, you know? I love that. I'm, I've learned a lot from that. I, I yeah. appreciate you giving such, okay. a, such an answer. But um, I'm just going to read a few things that have been said about you, because um, yeah. which I believe yeah, to be go. true. <laughs> so, John Savadera of Den of Greek described your performance as absolutely hypnotic. Cheryl Eddy of LO9 termed it as mag mag magnetic. I'm going to learn to speak today. And Derek Thomas of Monday Morning Critic Podcast called you fearless. How do these objectives resonate with your understanding of your own craft and performances? Well, first, I'm really flattered, obviously. And I, I tell myself, too, that there's something I'm doing that's right. Um, you know, but but how it also encourage me, encourages me to keep doing, you know, in a way what I'm, I'm doing. Um how does it resonate? Well, you know, the fearlessness, I have a lot of fear, but it's true that being fearless is not having, not having fear. It's to be courageous and going, even though the fear is present, now it doesn't mean, you know, being reckless and not, <laughs> not, but you know what I mean? It's to a degree of, of in a safe way, you know, not letting at least the fear being the driver of the car, you know, because I, I can, I could do that, you know, uh, we, we can all do that. But then as an artist, again, that's that's the killer of art, you know, and it's not about me. So usually the fear is about me. I find, you know, it's, it's well, what if, you know, what I do, either I look ridicule or what if, you know, it just doesn't work or, you know, all these things that it can be is usually about me. And when I remember this is not about me, I'm, I'm a vehicle, you know, once again for that. And who do I want to be driving that vehicle you know and so yeah it, it, it's how I, I i i the fearless resonates with me again i have it but i try to go about it that way and i think sometimes it can be inspiring for people to also do it themselves you know mm -hmm. um, 
the magnetism. I don't know because that actually was, you know, written before. I would say now it's Kundalini Yoga because Kundalini Yoga, you do a lot of exercises for your magnetism. But oh. when this article was written, I didn't do Kundalini Yoga yet. <laughs> but, you know, we're all magnetic to, to an extent. And so I guess that, you know, when you come alive and you're touching the right thing, there is a magnetism to it. You know, people want to watch yeah. something gravity, you know. Uh, because it's something that's beyond us, I think, that happens, you know, that magic that, yeah. again, for us, I think your instrument, your job is to channel, you know, that that magic, you know, however you can, but leaving it about it. And then we can criticize it after and, you know, if we want, or at least, you know, look at what we've done uh, to have uh, an idea of it. But even then, to be careful with that, because, you know, I find myself being, I watch what I do, you know, to, to learn. Uh, but it can be easily, you can fall into the, you know, oh, what if I had done this? And what? Yeah. And I think it's a way of, again, it's the way of looking at it. Okay, what can I gain from next time? Forgiving myself, forgiving, you know, and just trying better next time. And um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah completely and when you're in a situation i don't know if you have been in a situation so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm i'm gonna ask you if you've been in a situation where you're in a scene with an actor or an actress and they are maybe not seeing themselves as a vehicle uh in the performance they might be distracted they might not have the same amount of training that you have mm -hmm. how do you deal with that internally because i'm guessing mo more times than not if that does happen as you're not the director, you can't really um, mm -hmm. uh, really say much, if you get what I mean. So how do you deal with that? Or have you ever had to deal with something like that? Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it can be very fragile in a way because I think if someone doesn't ask me, you know, for any sort of help or any, I don't really, I'm careful with stepping in, you know, mm -hmm. because who am I? I trust whatever other people are doing and I try to work with it at my best. If someone is to ask me about anything, then I gladly do whatever, you know, I, I could to help either be more calm or, you know, to give the person time, depending, again, are we on a big production where, you know, there's less of that going on or are we on an indie film where maybe, you know, there's more of that possibility of time and, you know, but again, unless I'm, I'm I kind of feel it out, you know, and see if there's anything that I can do to make it better for everybody, uh, but, you know, um, yeah, as you said, it's not my place to tell whether the people do. What I tend to do, though, is, you know, every time I do start working on a on a project, I tell the other actors the way that I tend to work so that people are not so, you know, maybe taken aback. Uh, mm. Not that, you know, I'm weird or anything. It's just that I'm, I, I focus, you know, I like I don't like, for example, in between takes to be chatting or to be on my yeah. phone, things like that, you know, which I totally respect. Whoever people do whatever they want. It's also my job to adjust to how other people work, you know, and not be imposing my way. Um, so, yeah, but I also announce, you know, if I'm a bit quiet or if I'm not, you know, maybe joking and, be, you know, might, might be because I, I like to be focused and also because, you know, maybe I have ADHD that, like, I know I need <laughs> extra you know, focus, which is one of the main thing, you know, in Strasbourg, we, we do the work is about a lot about relaxation and concentration. Uh, he used to say that the relaxation helps our body to be in control of our body and the concentration to be in control of our mind. And that for me is important because as I said, you know, I'm an Aquarius, my mind is like, you know, <laughs> flying. So I, I just try my best to do that, but still not being, you know, like, here I come, nobody, you know, everybody shut up, none of that, you know, yeah, yeah. kind of, you know, so we communicate a bit and then people are who they are and, and we work together. I've never, I've been lucky so far not to um, have a big issue with anyone with any of this or, yeah. yeah. I'm really happy to hear that you haven't had any issues with everyone and the, the way you work sounds yeah. fascinating. I love that focus element to things mm -hmm. and being in control of your body, allowing yeah. you to really take on another character but mm -hmm. you've obviously as we've mentioned before trained very well a very high standard in a fantastic way mm -hmm. what would you say the key differences are between being a stage actor and a screen actor and what challenges have you faced going from one to the other mm -hmm. so i've never been in a production like a broadway production so in a big theater like that which mm -hmm. 
you know, today, I believe a lot of them are mic'd, you know, but one of the first thing that comes to me is obviously the sound, you know, okay. is a big difference if you don't, you're not mic'd. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of differences, but the approach is the same for me, you know, characters are characters, stories are stories. It's just the way of embodying that is different. Uh, the camera is much more subtle, you know, as you know, subtle at catching things. Um, and the theater, depending on also the size of the theater, how far you have to project and and kind of, you know, take up the, the space and and shine, you know, your 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 character, your energy um, versus, you know, the camera, the medium is just much, you know, closer. Um, but aside from these, you know, the body expression and the voice projection, the way to analyze, you know, characters is the same. I'd say the process of working on a play, even though today it's not like it used to be, the time that is given to actors, there's more time, I believe, you know, in rehearsals. And I would think that it's, you know, um, I guess it's depend it depends because if you were to do even a movie, you know, Abelatif Keshish, for example, this uh, filmmaker in France spends a lot of time, from what I read, uh, working on his projects. So it can be also a lot of time. But uh, yeah, I guess those are the first things that, that come to mind in comparing those two mediums. Okay. And when do you think you'll be on stage next? So I shouldn't, that's, so I should, I'll rephrase the question. Yeah. Do you want to be on stage again? Mm -hmm. it, do yeah. you want to do Broadway stuff? Because... Mm -hmm. I don't know how exactly how it works in New York, but I'm guessing agents operate in a different way, maybe. Um, some may be leaning towards television, some towards musicals, some mm -hmm. towards straight um, theatre. Which yeah. direction do you want to go in? You know, any, um, I don't have, I love TV, I love films, I love theatre. All of it, as I said, you know, for me, are storytelling. Uh, and I enjoy, diff you know, different things from each respectively, but also overall, it's the same, you know, process. But yeah, my agents and my managers from the history of the ones I've had were not as much into the theater scene. I don't get as many opportunities through my reps for that. Uh, but I do go to, I'm an equity member. And so I'm able to go to Broadway calls, you know, and secure myself a slot when it's not completely full in a second. So, you know, what are the chances really, you know, in those, they, they, I don't know, you know, cause I haven't booked one of those, but I'm able to at least go and, you know, I auditioned for Doll's House, for example. And it was not just, that was on Broadway not long ago with Jessica Chastain and, you know, um, they ended up casting someone very different from, for that part, but she was also not, you know, an A-lister. Uh, so I believe that those things, you know, are very, very, uh, uh possible, um, and yeah, I'd love it. I, you know, a chance like that, you know, with, with, uh, with such, such creatives. Um, yeah. And even new material. I also, you know, we have the public theater here in New York. That's not right on Broadway, but it's a great theater. Playwrights Horizons, you know, um, there's a few really great way to do uh, theater here, but yeah, it's not happened to me to, yet to be uh, in that sort of cast in that sort of situation but i would definitely love to yeah and trying to excellent yeah. you mentioned your your agent and your manager mm -hmm. a lot of us i should say a lot of actors yeah. have uh, agents and act and managers clearly how important would you describe your relationship is with the agent and the manager and how would you define it for me, it's very important. I think it's probably very important for everybody. Now, the way people go about their uh, relationships, I think, can be very different. Um, I like to be somewhat, you know, close enough that there is a constant, you know, at least, let's say, every other week sort of communication, yeah. you know, not to talk about my private life, although it, it could, you know, if anything, like, that is impacting, you know, my work in any way that should be able to happen. Um, but also it's something that, you know, you feel inside for me when I've, for example, chosen the team that I'm currently with, which I changed not very long ago. Uh, it's been only since actually it was already the, the strikes when I changed the team that I, I worked with that I'm currently working with. And it's a feeling thing. I met with a few people and it's how they see the work. Their passion tends to be important to me. Uh, you know, if I don't feel that there's a real, you know, 
kind of passion, devotion to the craft, to the art, you know, yeah. and understanding who I am and the way they see me, you know, and then the way, yeah, we will collaborate together, how all that, you know, I, I find important to feel comfortable because it's, you know, it, yeah, it's, they're the people that are going to pitch you and, you know, it, it yeah, it, it matters uh, to me. Now, yeah. some people are much more, I know, uh, closer even in terms of person, you know, person to person with their personal lives. You know, that's not so much me, but I know some talents, for example, want that sort of, you know, able to call their agent manager and if they want to cry for, you know, yeah. however long, you know. Um, so for some people, I know that's important. And I think if that's important to you, not, you know, that's something you should, I would recommend, let's say, not doing that too much. But <laughs> at least if that's what you want, then having that sort of, you know, someone that clicks with you. But that can be, that can be very hard. There's a lot of demand. As we know, it's a very competitive industry. Uh, it's very hard to find uh, reps for, you know, for people. It was hard for me too, you know, throughout my career. And I've tried different things, different you know, different people. And I think people change also their reps throughout time. You know, they evolve yeah. and not always. Sometimes they stick together, I think, for very long. But yeah, I think it has to be a give and take and and the the rep has to be really excited about you. They have to be one of your biggest fan, you know? Completely. And you have to trust in them too. And, you know, because we also have to trust that they're doing what they're doing. Cause also, otherwise I, I seen that I've, you know, when you, you really question, you know, what's going, are they doing anything, you know, is, you know, and then being upset at the rep and sometimes, you know, it, it can be definitely justified, you know, but also sometimes it's, it's complicated on the other side too. And so, yeah, I guess, I am going back to always the instinct and the feeling and knowing what do I want, you know? And so, okay, once I know what I want, is there someone out there that wants what I have? And, and yeah. Out of all of the projects you've done and all the training that you've had, what one project do you hold close to your heart and why? You know, the different things for different reasons. So would I have one that sticks out more? I don't know because Obviously, you know, Servant and Castle Rock, uh, you know, were the ones that were the most seen and were the most as we tend to want. You know, as an actor, of course, you want to be able to work with more prominent, you know, people so that you can keep on working. So, mm -hmm. you know, but also be, I learned so much on Servant, you know, that I didn't learn on Castle Rock um, about myself and looking back at what I did and then doing that sort of work that I, I mentioned earlier of rewatching and being able to say, okay, I could have done this here and here I know where, you know, I wasn't trusting or I didn't take chances and kind of trying to, you know, take those notes and, uh, and, and grow from it. But so I, I'd say those two obviously come to me, you know, because it, you know, it's JJ Abrams, it's Stephen King. Yeah. They're so, you know, talented and Chemnay yeah. Chamberlain is so talented. The cast is so talented. So, you know, I got to work with so many directors on Servant and learn the differences. And that was really tough for me, you know, on some level, but I, I needed to learn that. And um, yeah, so it was more challenging for me to work on Servant than it was on Castle Rock and also relearning from Castle Rock, you know, oh, those things that I had implemented there, why didn't I do it on Servant and what happened? And it was supposed, you know, yeah. during the pandemic too, there was different circumstances going around, you know, personally and worldwide. But I guess those would be, those would be the two that come to mind because of the high level of talent there. But, you know, I, I really enjoyed working on the little, little indies that I've worked on before and working just even in school and getting to explore all these things to begin with, um, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I don't, I don't want sense. to value it too much because, you know, well, it's like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I completely understand. And, and yeah. lastly, what can we see from you in the future? What great projects are coming out soon from you? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Look, on my own, I am writing uh, quite a yeah. bit lately, but I'm taking my time. Um, okay. But from the outside, I don't know. Right now, there's nothing yeah. that I've been called back for. You know, obviously, with what's going on, there hasn't been 
very much opportunities. But I'm actually headed to France right now. I'm represented over there yeah. in Paris. Yeah, so I'm heading there at the end of the week and I'm going to meet uh, with a couple of great casting directors. So I'm looking forward to that. I don't know if something might happen there and then, um, but they are very, they're wonderful uh, casting directors. And so I look forward to sitting down with them. And, you know, if anything happens right away from that, who knows, you know? After all, it's a week of a big, uh, I think, an eclipse. So apparently, you know, I'm not super knowing of all that but enough to know that creatively speaking it's a, a charged time so maybe the stars are gonna align i don't know <laughs> oh excellent i hope they do i, I really 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 do thank and thanks so much for coming on filmmaking conversations i really appreciated it i really enjoyed speaking to you and hopefully we'll speak soon have you thought of upgrading your cinematography game would you like to have an asc cinematographer mentor you for free Join veteran cinematographer Suki Medenzevic, ASC, Disney, Pixar, FX Networks, Netflix, American Horror Story, as he teaches you how to create beautiful images using three lighting techniques he has mastered on film sets over his 30 plus years in the film industry. Each technique uses basic, low cost lighting equipment so that anyone can achieve beautiful visuals no matter your project's budget. If you want to take your cinematography to the next level, Visit FilmmakingConversations.com to sign up for instant access. If you like this podcast, share it with friends. Leave a comment in the comment section and hit the subscribe button. If you like this podcast, share it with friends. Leave a comment in the comment section and hit the subscribe button.